Hello, my name is Matthew Galuzzo, and I'm a criminal defense attorney at the law firm of Galuzzo and Arnon LLP here in New York City. My partner and I represent defendants in federal criminal courts all across the New York State area, but most often in the Southern District of New York, the Eastern District of New York, and the District of New Jersey. And one of the things that my clients frequently ask me right off the bat is, if I get convicted of this federal crime, how much jail time am I likely to do? And the answer to that question is actually pretty complicated, and it requires you to understand a little bit about the federal sentencing guidelines. And that's what the purpose of this video blog today is about. It's about um, the federal sentencing guidelines. Now, first and foremost, we have to understand that a conviction for a federal criminal charge typically carries a minimum and a maximum statutory uh, sentence, which is to say that the law itself tells you what is the minimum possible and the maximum possible sentence for a particular charge. For example, in federal child pornography cases, a lot of those cases have five-year mandatory minimum jail sentences. So there's nothing you can do if you get convicted of that crime to get yourself a sentence less than five years in jail. Okay? But then the federal sentencing guidelines typically narrow things down for judges a little bit and give you a little bit better idea of what you can realistically expect to get within that range of the statutory minimum and statutory maximum. Now you have to understand the federal sentencing guidelines are actually just that. They are guidelines. They are not mandatory. Judges don't have to follow the guidelines, but the truth is, is that they usually do. And the federal sentencing guidelines have been promulgated by the federal government, uh, and it just reflects their opinion as to what an appropriate sentence for a particular conviction or a particular type of defendant ought to be. And most federal judges at least they have to address the federal sentencing guidelines in making their decision, and most of the time they adhere to those guidelines in arriving at their sentence, but not always. So the next question becomes, how do the guidelines work? Well, the guidelines are actually set forth in a chart, uh, and I can show you somewhat uh, how this works with this uh, blown up version of the chart. Now, this chart is available online. You can look at the federal sentencing guidelines sentencing chart, or you can find it on our website. Okay? Now, if you can see here, uh, there are a number of little boxes up and down this chart. And inside those boxes are numbers. And those numbers represent a range in months for the guideline sentence that might apply to a particular defendant. So up here, for example, it says zero to six in this little white box. And that represents a guideline sentence of zero to six months in jail for somebody who falls within that part of the sentencing guidelines. Now down here, for example, uh, this is for a much more serious offense and someone with a much more serious criminal record. This sentencing guideline range is 92 to 115 months, which puts you more in the range of about uh, you know, eight years or more. Okay? Now, um, there's two axes, obviously, on this chart. And so, in order to decide where a person falls in the federal sentencing guidelines, you have to do two things. First, you have to determine the criminal history category of the defendant. Okay? That's this axis, this X axis up here. Okay? Over here, uh, this would represent somebody who has no criminal record or a very minor criminal record. And this over here represents somebody who has a very bad criminal record, unfortunately, multiple felony convictions that might make them a career offender, as that term is used. So the sentences in this column are, understandably, less severe than the sentences over in this column. If you have a large criminal record, your sentences under the guidelines are going to be more severe. So first, you determine where on the spectrum here, in terms of your criminal history, you would fall. Uh, and then the next thing you have to do is determine the offense level for the particular crime that has been uh, committed. So up here, this would be a very low level offense. This is offense level one, and this down here at the bottom is offense level 43. 43 would be a very, very serious type of crime. We're talking about homicides and conspiracies to commit as such, okay? And up here would be low level offenses. So up here, obviously, where there's a low criminal record and a low offense level, these are where the sentences are most lenient. And as a criminal defendant, you want to find yourself up here, not down here, where the sentences are enormous. Okay? So every crime, uh, based on the facts of that crime, has a sort of a presumptive or initial offense level. And that depends largely on the facts of that particular crime. For example, in a drug trafficking charge, uh, one of the things I'll look at is, what is the quantity of drugs that were trafficked? And that is what's going to govern the initial determination of the offense level. So if it's a low amount of drugs, you might be up here, where the numbers are not terrible. If it's a huge quantity of drugs being trafficked, then you might find yourself down here in terms of the offense level. And the guidelines set forth, with a lot of precision actually, just where on the guidelines, or what offense level you're supposed to be based upon various quantities uh, of drugs. In a financial fraud case, for example, 
uh, where on the offense level spectrum you fall is going to be a factor of the amount of money uh, that was uh, that was lost, uh, the number of victims, things of that nature are going to help you determine the offense level. Okay, so just because you have an initial offense level doesn't mean that's where you're going to end up, though. Uh, from there, people can go up or down, and the offense level makes a huge difference in the ultimate outcome of the sentence. Uh, somebody who pleads guilty early, for example, as opposed to going to trial and losing a trial, uh, gets the benefit of a couple levels adjustment upwards, which means in the more lenient direction. It shows that the defendant accepted responsibility, and judges tend to give them a benefit by giving them less of a sentence if they plead guilty as opposed to going to trial. Uh, for example, if you're a cooperator with the government, if you decide to be state's witness and provide information to them, you may actually get a departure upward in terms of your offense level. If you are found to have been a less uh, serious player in the conspiracy, for example, you weren't the mastermind of the organization that uh, was committing criminal acts, but you played a very small role, you may also get a reduction in your offense level uh, based upon the guidelines. Now, there are aggravating factors as well that can take you downwards and make your sentence more harsh. If, for example, children were hurt as a result of your crime, or firearms were somehow used, or violence was somehow used in the commission of your crime, then that can be an aggravating factor which could push your uh, offense level uh, downwards, which means you're getting into more serious uh, offense territory. So those two things have to happen first. You determine the uh, criminal history of the defendant, then you determine the final offense level uh, for that person, and then that would allow you to arrive at a guidelines sentence for a particular individual. But that doesn't mean that the person's going to get a sentence within the guidelines. It's up to your attorney at that point to make the best arguments that he possibly can to get the judge to depart or to give you a variance from the sentencing guidelines. Now there's a whole host of arguments that have been set forth by other judges and by other courts as to what sorts of arguments can allow a judge to depart from the sentencing guidelines. There are things like uh, post-offense rehabilitation. Perhaps you've, you were a drug addict when you committed the crime and now you've gotten clean and sober. Sometimes people get a departure based on that. There's a whole host of other things that people can do uh, to try to convince a judge to uh, depart from the guidelines and give somebody a sentence better than what the guidelines would suggest. Uh, we here at Galuzzo and Johnson, we've never had anybody get anything worse than the very bottom of the guideline range that, that person uh, that applied to that person. Most of our clients have been sentenced well below the guidelines range that were suggested by the uh, sentencing guidelines table. And so uh, we're very proud of that fact. Uh, the key to uh, convincing a judge is understanding all of the available arguments and trying to put forth the most persuasive and most compelling um, pitch for leniency. And so if you or a friend or a loved one have been arrested or are facing federal charges in the New York State area, we highly recommend that you give us a call here at Galuzzo and Arnone. Give us a call at 212-323-7409 to talk about our possible representation of you or to have your questions answered about the federal sentencing guidelines. Thank you.